Hey everyone, welcome back to a new video. Before I begin on the stories, I just wanted to mention, if you have your own personal scary story that you would like to send me for me to possibly narrate here on the channel, you can do so by sending it to southerncannibal.com. So if you have a personal true scary story that you'd like to share, please consider sending it my way. Now that all that's out of the way, let's begin. This happened about six years ago around July of 2016. At the time, I was 12 and my brother was 8 and we were on our way back home from a family vacation with our mom. For some background, my parents had divorced when I was really young, so every summer we would take two vacations, one with our mom and one with our dad. We were halfway through our journey home when we decided it would be a good idea to stop at a rest area to stretch our legs and grab a bite to eat. The rest area we stopped at had a gas station, as well as a fast food restaurant attached to it. As we parked the car, I noticed that there were only two other cars in the whole lot. A beat up white pickup truck and a dark blue sedan. The white truck will become important later. Walking into the gas station towards the bathrooms, I had noticed a man who was wearing what appeared to be a construction uniform. He had the cliche dirty jeans, white t-shirt, and high vis jacket on. I paid no attention to him and just continued my way into the women's bathroom. After I had finished my business and left, I had then noticed another man, dressed the exact same way as the first. I once again brushed it off, even though it made me a little uncomfortable and decided to meet up with my mom and brother by the fast food restaurant. We ordered our food and while waiting, I once again noticed another man, dressed the same as the first, just sitting in a booth all alone. He had no food or anything and was just sitting there looking at us and he was also talking in what I think to be Spanish to somebody on his phone. At this point, I had become pretty uneasy and red flags were popping up everywhere, but I remained calm as to not frighten my mother. Stupid, I know. A few minutes later, we got our food and we sat down in the middle booth that was positioned right next to a large window near the exits. As we began eating, the two other men that I saw from before came and sat down, sort of surrounding us. One was positioned in the booth right in front of us the other behind, and the other man was two rows away. Two of the men were talking on their phones and were continuous looking back and forth between each other. By this point, I knew that my mom had picked up on the situation and she began telling us to hurry up and to quickly finish our food. Well, about a few minutes later, something must have really frightened her because she made this face which I can only describe as a combination of fear, horror, and dread. She then whispered to my brother and I to calmly get up, throw our trash away, and then run to the car. Right when we got up, the two men who had previously been on their phones hung up and then moved towards the end of their respective booths. This was the moment when I realized that these men had something sinister planned, and my mom must have too, because right in that instant, she flew out of the booth, scooped up my brother, and we booked it to our car, which was probably about a hundred feet away. I have never ran so fast as I did in that moment, and I didn't stop until I was finally in the safety in the car. By this time, it was only our car and the white truck left in the parking lot. My mom began to quickly drive away, and that's when we saw the three men jump into the pickup truck and began to follow us. They followed us for a good 10 to 15 minutes, continuously honking their horn and yelling something before they eventually abruptly stopped and turned back around towards the direction of the rest area. I remember not stopping again until we got home. Recently, my mom told me about this incident as she knows about my fascination with true crime and scary stories and she told me something that made this whole encounter even more terrifying. She said that when we got home, she noticed two pink strings and one blue string tied around the rear driver's side door handle. None of us had any idea of what that meant, but we both believe it to have been some kind of marker or something related to human trafficking. 
I had continuously looked at news reports for the same area this all happened in, and I never did see anything that sounded similar to our experience. My mom never did tell me what she saw that made her jump out of that booth. She just always avoided it whenever I asked. I'm really grateful for her sharp instincts. To this day, I really hope it was all just a misunderstanding, but something deep down inside tells me it wasn't. I'll provide detail information before I initiate my intriguing story. I'm currently a 16-year-old 5'7 male with a thin and delicate body. Because I have several health-related problems, I'm required to have at least one checkup appointment each month. Hospitals and clinics within our country can get really expensive, especially for someone like me who doesn't own health insurance. Therefore, I had to look for more affordable approaches. Soon enough, I found my best option yet, our neighboring country, Mexico. Because of my distant appointments, I was forced to travel frequently with my parents, and after a while, I eventually got used to it. A few months passed and everything was going as planned. My parents and I haven't faced any inconveniences at all, and truly, I wasn't expecting any. Regardless, one day while I was heading to my monthly consultation, I found the sudden urge to use the restroom, and going to the nearest gas station was my first and only option. As my father was parking near a gas pump, I had noticed a tall man standing from the darkest corner of the building, silently staring at us with a wide grin. At first, I decided to brush it off, thinking it may have just been a coincidental eye contact, but I still decided to wait longer in the vehicle until he was gone. I waited for what seemed like an eternity, but the man just refused to leave. Once again, I decided to inspect him one last time before exiting my vehicle, and as I carefully watched his every move, I noticed that he had a big professional camera. This frightened me a little, thinking he may be wanting to capture an image of me walking in the parking lot. Finally, I got out of my vehicle and proceeded to approach the building with caution. As I did so, I heard live footsteps behind me, almost as if whoever it was was trying to be unnoticed. I slightly turned back and saw the cameraman, and he was now directing his eyes to a random poster on the wall and then walked into the gas station. Once inside the building, still holding the camera, the man entered the restrooms. I completely disregarded my need to use the restroom at this point because of my intense fear. Nevertheless, I decided to make my time by buying some drinks and chips for the rest of my family, who were still waiting for me outside. As I was paying, the cameraman told the cashier if he could capture a quick portrait of them, as he had just gotten the camera and he wanted to test out most of his functions. Well, the cashier denied his request, and this immediately caused the man to then rage. He began referring to the cashier with inappropriate nicknames, and also tossed several products across the store. After finishing his tantrum, he looked directly at me and pointed his camera at me. I quickly blocked his view with the magazine, and I told him to stop, or else I'd call the cops. This seemed to frustrate him even more, but he did eventually walk out. After paying for my food, I exited the building, and I saw him arguing with my father. I was still somewhat far away from them, but I instantly sensed danger. Once I was close enough, I saw a bright glint from the corner of my eye. It was a knife in the man's hand. I felt defenseless, I was weak, and I couldn't possibly do anything to impede any harm towards my father. Luckily, a police officer arrived at the gas station, and he then saw the events that were quickly unfolding. I felt relieved, but that feeling would only last shortly because the maniac fled the scene as soon as he saw the officer. To this day, I'll never forget the man's last words. I have your picture. I'll find you soon. I don't forget. According to my parents, I apparently passed out after that, and I have no memory of the aftermath of these events. So yeah, 
I guess I'll just end this with, please be safe out there. This happened when I was in the 8th grade, during the middle of summer break. My friend Kathy was going to be moving before our freshman year of high school, so we were hanging out a lot. We only lived a few minutes away from each other, so we would hang out almost every day. That day we were hanging out at her house for a sleepover, and I had the broad idea to go to the park that was right across the street from her house. She agreed, and we also thought to get snacks at the gas station after we hung out at the park. When we got there, we were doing what we usually do. Play on the playground. Let's make it clear, I was wearing shorts and a baggy shirt, and Kathy was wearing a skirt and a t-shirt. I was up on the slide, and Kathy was trying to climb up. I then said, Kathy, be careful, you're wearing a skirt. I didn't want her to flash people. As I said this, I noticed a man who looked to be in his late 30s or early 40s look at us. At the time, I didn't really think anything of it. We were being pretty loud, so maybe he just wanted to make sure we were okay. I told my friend and she just laughed, so I calmed down. We then saw the man walk around a few times but we didn't really care as it was a public park anyways. After about an hour, I got bored, and I saw that across from us is a little beach, since the park was nearby the river. I then asked Kathy if she wanted to go over there, and she agreed. When we got over there, we started to take off our shoes, since we didn't want them to get wet. That's when Kathy then said, Bailey, look. It's the guy from the park. I looked up, and sure enough, there was the same guy from the park walking across the bridge. I was confused, but I told Kathy that maybe his car could be over here, or that he could be going to the bar nearby. We forgot all about it, and for a good hour, we were just having fun. We both finally decided that we should start heading back, so we went over to our stuff and started to get ready. I sat down on the ground to get my shoes, when Kathy then said, Bailey, get up. I was really confused and asked why, and what she said next gave me the chills. She then said, The guy from the park is coming down by us. Now let me make this clear, where we were at was covered in trees, and cars were zooming above us on the bridge, so really no one could see or hear us. The guy came down and started to ask if we were doing drugs. We both said no, but he just kept saying if we were, he wouldn't tell, and for us just to let him hit some of it. Finally, Kathy then said we were minors and to back off, which he said he was a minor too, and he was 19. Finally, Kathy then said we were 14, and he was shocked, and he seemed to not even believe it until I said to him the same thing, that we were indeed 14. He said he was sorry, and then walked away. I then told Kathy that we need to go near a public area, just in case it came back with people, and Kathy agreed. I went up first up the hill, and as we got to the top, I stopped and turned around, and when I finally got down there, there was a guy on the phone across from us by the bar. After he saw us, he went to the back of the building, and then ran across the bridge to the park. We stayed at the park for about a good hour, and finally, we then called the police. The police took our statement on him, and they said if they saw him, they would ask him why he asked us that stuff. We just said thank you, and we finally went back to Kathy's house. As we got to her house, that's when something hit me, and I realized something. I didn't want to say it out loud because Kathy was scared. But I then remembered that we saw that guy about three hours before he came down to talk to us, which meant he went all the way from the park to the bridge. Which means he might have been watching us that whole time, and that really gives me the chills to this day. I never did get a call back from the police about the guy, which either makes me think he got away, or that the police just really didn't care.
The story happened back in 2019 during my junior year of college. I attended a small university in South Central Michigan, which was also in a very small town. Since my freshman year, I had worked as a security officer for the school while taking classes. The school was small enough that they could only afford two full-time security officers, and the rest of the team was hired students. There was also a small police department right across from the campus, but they only had two or three officers that didn't work 24-7. So from 8pm to 8am, student workers covered security for the school. The job mostly consisted of driving around in our security vehicle, as well as writing tickets for people who parked in the wrong lots, locking the buildings once night classes had ended, and checking to make sure the dorm's emergency doors were secure. It was not a very exciting job, but it paid well. So at the time of this story, I had been with the department for almost three years, and the most exciting thing to happen was writing tickets, which I hated doing by the way. Now there was one part of the job that almost everyone hated doing more than I hated writing tickets, and that was the 12 a.m. to 4 a.m. church check. For some context, the school I attended was a religious college, hence its small size. So being a religious university, it was partnered with a large church that was pretty much right on campus. And when I say large church, I mean this church was huge. It also served as a school for a while, so there were a lot of classrooms and meeting rooms. So part of the job as a security officer was going into the church between 12 and 2 a.m., and making sure the alarms were set and that all the exterior doors were shut and locked. The entire walkthrough took roughly 10 to 15 minutes, but it was a terrifying 10 to 15 minutes. Parts of the church were near 150 years old, and then the bulk of the church was much newer. There were many dark and creepy rooms, and the whole thing just screamed horror movie. I had done the check numerous times, and I'd gotten used to the creepiness of the whole thing. But as the manly man I am, I would sometimes bring my girlfriend with me. Now, I wasn't supposed to bring anyone with me on these checks, who was also not part of the security team. But it was 2 a.m. on a Friday night, so I figured it was fine and no one would ever find out. Plus, she really liked walking through the creepy empty church with me. So I picked her up from her dorm in the security vehicle and drove over to the church. We walked right out front and I unlocked the main door and we went inside. Now right before we entered the church, I noticed a brown slash gold Buick sitting next to the church. This is not entirely odd because the church a lot was sometimes used by commuter students. I thought it was odd that a commuter was still parked there at 2am on a Friday night but I figured they were hanging out with friends late on campus. And as I said, I hated writing tickets, so I just let it go and we went inside. The way the church walkthrough works is that all the exterior dorms and alarms can be checked if you keep taking right turns. So I would start with the hallway on the right when you immediately walked in and proceeded to check all the exterior doors. My girlfriend and I made our way through the dark and creepy hallways and offices checking doors and making sure all the alarms were set. The church staff was pretty good at locking up, and rarely did I find an exterior door left unlocked. And as per usual, we came down to the last set of doors, and all was good. Now all that was left was to walk through the main chapel and to the adjacent hallway, and then back to the front lobby and out the doors. The chapel was massive, sat maybe 300 to 400 people with a second story balcony where the sound booth and the other tech equipment storage was. Pretty much immediately as my girlfriend and I stepped into the chapel, I noticed on the second story balcony that there was an equipment room with the light on. The door to the room looked like a door that you would see in a school with a small rectangular window, but as I looked at the door with light coming from it, I noticed the shadowy shape of a person standing in the room. I shined my flashlight up to the door, and the person then immediately moved to the side, and then the light went off. I told my girlfriend to hold still, as I held my light pointed at the door. A few seconds went by, and a bald man, 
maybe in his 40s to 50s, stepped back into the window. I couldn't really tell if he was looking at me, but he then opened the door and then slammed it shut and then quickly walked across the balcony behind the tech booth where there happens to be a doorway that leads to an upper lobby type area and to the staircases that lead down to the main lobby. Now, this was not entirely weird as I've been checking the church before and sound techs have been working there late at night, but never has one of them ever acted like this. And I would usually recognize most of the sound workers who would be there that late. I then gave my keys to the security vehicle to my girlfriend, and I told her to lock herself inside, and I would be out shortly. I followed her to the lobby, and I watched her get into the car and lock it. I sat and just listened for anything. Although, I knew that there was likely some explanation for this, but it was all just a bit weird. Honestly, at the time, I was really more worried about someone saying I had brought my girlfriend with me at the church than with anything. So I slowly made my way up to the closest set of stairs to the upper level. The stairs led to an upper lobby area, and straight across was another set of stairs that led down to another entrance. As I slowly made my way up, listening for anything, I simply said, Hello? Anybody there? It's campus safety. Trying to make myself known, and maybe clear the air if I had simply spooked a late night worker, but I heard nothing back. I peeked around the corner to the balcony, and there was no one to be seen. I turned back around, and standing there was the bald man, now standing only ten feet away from me. I realized this dude was at least six foot six, and very, very skinny. He looked very decrepit, and he had no emotion on his face. I, for one, nearly shit myself, because I didn't hear him at all but I was able to laughily say, Sorry, sir, I didn't see you there. But he didn't say anything. He just stood there with no expression. It was then that I realized this guy was not a sound tech working late. I took a step back, trying to gauge of what this dude was going to do. Keep in mind that I'm not armed in any way. As a student worker, we're not allowed to carry any weapons outside of pepper spray which I, of course, did not have. Now, I was a 21-year-old male and well-built, so I didn't feel too physically afraid of this man. But the moment was just so bizarre, my immediate reaction was just to get some distance between me and the man. As I stemmed back, he didn't approach me, but he almost started swaying forward and backward and what I can only describe as moaning, like his mouth was sewn shut. I was really at a loss for words, and just shocked. I then slowly stepped out sort of towards and around him, when he then bolted, like a creature out of a horror movie. This lanky ass old man took off away from me, and I then heard his footsteps pounding down the stairs to the back entrance. Now, I like being a security officer, but I didn't get paid enough to chase this guy, let alone search him for that maze of a church if he chose to hide in there. Now shitting myself, I ran down the stairs across from where he had gone, and then out the door, to then to the car my girlfriend was waiting in. She saw how freaked out I looked, and asked if everything was okay. Before I could even begin to form a sound to explain what happened, that gold-colored Buick went tearing through the parking lot and out into the main road. To this day, I have no idea who that guy was, or what he was doing in the church that late. I know some people might think it was a ghost or whatever, but most ghosts don't have a getaway car. I wrote up an incident report to my boss, and he was really pissed that I didn't write down the license plate of the car when I'd first seen it. But again, I hate writing tickets, so it didn't even cross my mind. I also admitted the part of my report where my girlfriend was with me, because that probably would have cost me my job. Anyway, it may not be the scariest story compared to most, but looking back, it was one of the creepiest encounters of my life.